Islam came to protect society from criminals and not to protect criminals at the expense of society part 2. The Sanctity of Life in Islam Life in Islam is sacred because preservation of it is one of Islam's legal objectives. Islam has come to protect life because life is a divine gift from God. So important is the preservation of life that the Quran teaches us that any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people. Since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. al maida 32 Due to Cain's murder of his brother, I informed the Israelites that any person who kills another person for no valid reason, such as legal retribution or as punishment for causing corruption in the land by treason or waging war, it is as if he has killed all people, since he did not make a distinction between an innocent and a guilty person. Whoever refrains from killing a person whose soul I have made sacred, and regards it to be forbidden to kill such a person, it is as if he has given life to all people. Because in such an action lies the safety of all people. My messengers brought to the Israelites clear signs and evidences. Despite this many of them overstepped my limits by committing sins and going against the messengers, al Maida 32. This verse eloquently illustrates to us the sanctity of human life and the magnitude of the crime of taking just one life. This verse equates the taking of one life to all life, and this is not just a symbolic gesture. The scholars of Islam state that equating one life to all life is because when a person takes a life unjustly he has arbitrarily set a precedent to take any life unjustly. Since, what would be the preventing factor in not taking life when life isn't held as sacred or there is little regard for law that protects life? And in this way, a single soul becomes representative of all souls because all souls are intrinsically sacred, but the seal of sacredness is removed when just one life is taken unjustly. In Islam, the taking of human life unjustly violates three rights, one, the right of Allah, two, the victim's right to live, and three, the right of the next of kin who suffer a terrible loss. The right of Allah is restored through sincere repentance. The right of the victim cannot be restored until the day of judgment, a day when all scores amongst humans are settled. The right of the victim's next of kin cannot be absolved until the murderer hands himself over to them. The law of Islam provides the victim's next of kin three legal options, 1. They can exact revenge, cheers, 2. They can take blood money, dry up, or 3. They can pardon him for his crime. This is how serious Islam takes the shedding of innocent blood. The Prophet said, a believer remains at liberty regarding his religion as long as he does not spill blood unlawfully. Sahih al-Bukhari In the absence of God, the value of life drops dramatically because nothing divine or objective gives life any intrinsic worth. Nihilism, which is the purest form of atheism, is a philosophical doctrine that suggests the lack of belief in one or more reputedly meaningful aspects of life. Most commonly, nihilism is presented in the form of existential nihilism, which argues that life is without objective meaning, purpose, or intrinsic value. Moral nihilists assert that morality does not inherently exist and that any established moral values are abstractly contrived. It is no coincidence that with the rise of secular godlessness, nihilism and hedonism we have seen a rise in the mass slaughter of human lives. This can be seen in the two global world wars which were not fought in religious pretexts. For instance, the First World War, 1914 to 1918, saw 9 million combat deaths and 6 million civilian deaths. This calamity was something new in human experience. Its scale, its technological relentlessness, its man-made quality. Were unprecedented. This mass globalized slaughter did not have religion at its heart and was facilitated by technological progress. Moreover, history's worst war, the Second World War, 1939 to 1945, saw 50 to 80 million deaths, genocide and the mass slaughter of civilians, the genocide of the Holocaust. The genocide and the nuclear annihilation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bombing of Dresden and much, much more. These historical calamities show the fallacy of arguing that, in the words of Karen Armstrong, there is a violent essence inherent in religion. Which inevitably radicalizes any conflict where a compromise becomes impossible and cruelty knows no bounds and that only secular liberalism can produce peace and stability. And high suicides rates. Disturbingly, suicide is a greater cause of death than murder, and there is data to suggest that self killing finds accepting attitudes in secular segments of societies and, hence, people consider self killing as an option during times of personal crises, whereas people from religious communities seem not to accept self killing as an option. Interestingly, the same study showed that the religious are more positive toward persons who have considered suicide for one reason or another. 
In A History of Suicide, the author, Jennifer Michael Hecht, shows how religious prohibitions against self-killing were replaced by the Enlightenment's insistence on the rights of the individual. Even when those rights had troubling applications, Thus, it was unsurprising to find that atheist anti-religion philosophers defended suicide. It is also interesting to note that suicide in Sweden, which is one of the most atheist countries in the world, that is the leading cause of death among men aged 20 to 44. When you detach life from its maker, you also detach life from its designated purpose and in the absence of purpose, life loses its moral compass that points true north. It may be illegal to take life under secular law, but under religious law, it is a sin which embodies a concept much greater than illegality. There is another verse in the Quran that instructs Muslims. And do not kill anyone whom Allah has forbidden, except for a just cause. Do not kill the soul whose life Allah has protected through faith or a pledge of security, except if the killing is merited on the basis of treason or legal retribution. If someone is killed unjustly, without a valid reason permitting his being killed, I have given his successor who takes charge of his affairs certain authority over the killer. He may demand that the killer be killed in retribution, or he may forgive him without asking for anything in return, or he may forgive him and take the blood money. But he shall not mutilate the killer, or by killing him with something that he did not use to kill, or by killing someone other than the killer, even if he was a helper and supporter. al Isra 33 Just to be clear that the rulers and those in authority are being addressed in this verse and not the general masses of Muslims. This connection between life and God reminds the Muslims that the crime of taking life is not just a crime against humanity. But it is also a crime against the one who gave life and forbade ending it without just cause. Life, when linked to God, breathes objectivity into the sanctity of life which we can all share in, but life in the absence of God only makes life important because humans say so. But what happens when humans stop saying so? Is prevention better than cure or is cure better than prevention even when there is no cure? In principle, this is a silly optional question, but in practice, you may be surprised by how much the latter option is true in Western societies. Let us have a look at the contents of this maxim from an Islamic perspective and then we will see how it is applied in a Western environment. Islam has a three-step policy for preventing and reducing crime. The third step is the external deterrent that discourages the public from criminal activity by enforcement of effective legal punishments. The second step is to block the means that lead to all forms of criminal activity. The first step is the internal deterrent which cultivates in the Muslim spiritual and moral awareness that inwardly polices him ideologically and ethically. The Quran expresses the first step, the desired step, a lot more eloquently. O oh, you who believe! If you obey and have taqwa of Allah, he will grant you a criterion to judge between right and wrong. O oh, you who believe in Allah and his messengers, know that if you are mindful, following what he instructs and staying away from what he has prohibited, he will give you the ability to discriminate between truth and falsehood, so you will not be confused as regards to them, and he will erase from you the evil you have committed. And forgive your sins. To Allah belongs immense bounty, and from his great bounty is his paradise which he has prepared for those who are mindful among his creation. Al-Anfal 29 Linguistically taqwa means forbearance, fear and abstinence, but in the Islamic terminology, taqwa has a distinct meaning. Taqwa is a high state of heart, which keeps one conscious of Allah's presence and his knowledge, and it motivates him to perform righteous deeds and avoid those which are forbidden. The cultivation of good moral conduct is the first line of defense in combating social diseases and evils. Prayer in Islam is a spiritual means for cultivating good moral conduct that prevents one from immoral and harmful acts. The Quran informs us that Indeed, prayer prohibits immorality and wrongdoing, and the remembrance of Allah is greater. And Allah knows that which you do. Read, O Messenger, to people what Allah has revealed to you of the QA with Makronen, and do the prayer in the most perfect manner. Prayer that is discharged perfectly restrains the doer from falling into sins and wrong because it creates a light in the heart that prevents the perpetration of sins and guides the person to doing righteous deeds. The remembrance of Allah is greater than and superior to everything. Doing None of your actions are hidden from him and he None of your actions are hidden from him and he will recompense you for them. If they are good the recompense will be good and if they are evil the recompense will be evil. Al Ankabut 45. Islam places great emphasis and importance on cultivating upright, moral individuals for the creation of a morally sound society. 
The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, the best of people are those that bring most benefit to the rest of mankind. Darkutani, Hassan. Islam commands every virtue known to man and forbids every immoral quality known to man. The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said, It is obligatory for you to tell the truth, for truth leads to virtue and virtue leads to paradise. And the man who continues to speak the truth and endeavors to tell the truth is eventually recorded as truthful with Allah. And beware of telling of a lie for telling of a lie leads to obscenity and obscenity leads to hellfire. And the person who keeps telling lies and endeavors to tell a lie is recorded as a liar with Allah. Sahih Muslim The second step, which complements the first step, is founded on the highly effective Islamic maxim, blocking the means. Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah said, a dana is anything which is used to achieve a certain end. But it has been commonly known amongst jurists to refer to anything which leads to something forbidden. And which is not considered an evil act in itself if it is not used to lead to such a forbidden end. That is why it has been stated that dana is the act which is apparently permissible but which leads to the commission of an act that is forbidden. All means that are likely to lead to social or personal ills are to be blocked for the well-being of the individual and the society. An example of this can be found by combining two verses from the Quran. The first one states, And do not approach unlawful sexual intercourse. Surely it is ever an immorality and an evil way. Be careful of fornication and avoid things that prompt it. It is extremely detestable and bad path to traverse as it leads to the mixing of lineages and punishment from Allah. Al Isra 32. The second verse states, Tell the believing men to lower their gaze from looking at forbidden things and protect their private parts from illegal sexual acts, etc. That is purer for them. Verily, Allah is all aware of what they do. O Messenger, tell the believing men to stop their eyes from looking at women and private parts that are unlawful for them. And to protect their private parts from indulging in the unlawful and from exposing them. That refraining from looking at what Allah has made unlawful is purer for them in the sight of Allah. Allah is aware of what you do. And no 30. If we look at the first verse carefully, we will see that it states, and do not approach, which means, do not come near to this forbidden act. The second verse provides us the method of how to stay clear of this forbidden thing by lowering the gaze that ignites the flame of sexual attraction. Islam also prohibits the free mixing of the sexes, pornography and any other social vice that can lead to what the Prophet Muhammad informed us of over 1,400 years ago. Immorality never appears among a people to such an extent that they commit it openly. But plagues and diseases that were never known among the predecessors will spread among them. Sunan IBN Major, 536. They commit it openly, so embedded and open is adultery in Western societies that there are dating sites for married people that are capitalizing off adultery. One website, which has 33 million members, was hacked recently and its members were blackmailed with threatening letters to reveal their membership to friends and family. The website even proudly boasts the hedonistic slogan, Life is short. Have an affair. The irony here is that hacking websites is a crime, for which you are labeled a criminal, but hacking your marriage is not, for which you are just labeled a victim. Imagine, HIV, since the beginning of the epidemic, almost 78 million people have been infected with the HIV virus and about 39 million people have died of HIV. Globally, 35.0 million, 33.2 to 37.2 million people were living with it at the end of 2013. Only clinically observed in 1981 in the United States, thus being an undeniable example of what happens when promiscuity becomes rife amongst the people. I guess it is no coincidence that UNAIDS.org states that around 270,000 people are living with it in the Middle and North Africa region which is an overall HIV prevalence of 0.1% among adults ages 15 to 49 and one of the lowest rates among world regions. Then we have to factor in this important fact that the first cases of AIDS in the Middle and North Africa were reported in the mid-1980s. And that the vast majority of these cases were linked to HIV exposure abroad and HIV contaminated blood products or organ transplants. If this is not an exemplary example of prevention is better than cure, then we do not what is. Let us take another example of what happens when you block the means to a rampant social evil and what happens when you do not. The Quran states, O Prophet, your companions ask you about wine, which refers to anything that impairs the mind or intoxicates it, with respect to the legal aspects of drinking, selling and purchasing it. They also ask you about gambling, which refers to wealth taken in a competition between two people in which both contribute to the winning total. 
Say in response to them, they both have many spiritual and material harms, such as loss of intellect and wealth and the creation of hatred and enmity. On the other hand, there are a few benefits, such as financial reward for the winner of a bet. However, the harm and sin resulting from them is greater than the benefit, so, a logical person should avoid such actions. This statement of Allah lays the foundation for the prohibition of wine. Al-Baqarah 219 In Islam, the crime of dealing with alcohol, harm in this world and the hereafter, is greater than its profit, but is that the same for Western countries? Do Western countries place the well-being of its citizens above the immense profits that are made from the toxic consumption of alcohol? How about the fact that in the United Kingdom, 1.53% of violent incidents involving adults were alcohol-related. 1,327,000 total violent incidents in 2013-14. 53%. alcohol-related violent incidents in 2013-14. Would you consider this a civil example of putting the public safety first over the liberal values of self-serving freedom? So, let us get this straight, Muslim countries, like Saudi, are barbaric and backwards for their implementation of legal punishments to prevent such destructive social diseases, but the West, on the other hand, is moderate and fair despite the fact that more than half of violent incidents last year were fueled by alcohol consumption. That sounds like a ripe case of take the log out of your own eye. Such is the destructive nature of alcohol that it has all the acid-like properties to corrode every single legal objective of Islam, and because of that, Islam has put in place stringent contingences to prevent this. The Prophet Muhammad cursed ten types of people who dabble in this liquid poison. The one who presses it, the one who has it pressed, its drinker, its carrier, and the one it is carried to, its server, its seller, the consumer of its price. The one who purchases it and the one it was purchased for. Add to Midi. These words of the Prophet serve as a real reminder of, 1. Islam's preventive attitude towards the spread of social evils and, 2. How serious Islam takes the welfare and well-being of the individual and the society. The results of Islam's prevention is better than cure program can be seen in the following geographical chart which highlights alcohol death rates per 1,000. 000 around the world, red equals high and gray equals low. Sometimes, we myopically look at these social diseases, for example, alcohol and promiscuous sexual behavior, as coexisting independently when the reality is that they thrive in each other's environments. The World Health Organization, WHO, in their 148-page research paper, Alcohol Use and Sexual Risk Behavior, states, Key patterns of interaction between alcohol use and sexual behavior related to the following issues. 1. The construction of maleness in terms of alcohol use. 2. A denial and neglect of risk as a way of coping with life. 3. The use of alcohol-serving venues as contact places for sexual encounters. 4. The use of alcohol at during, first, sexual encounters. 5. The promotion of alcohol use in pornographic material. So embedded and interlaced in Western societies are certain social diseases that Alcohol advertising and particularly the message that having a good time even finding a partner of one's dreams go hand in hand with alcohol use. Ibid. In the beginning of this paper, the BBC report stated nonchalantly that dozens of them, people who were executed, were convicted of non-violent crimes. Including drug offences as if there is nothing violent about drug offences. Such is the compounded violent nature of pharmaceutical and recreational drugs that not only do they cause physical and psychological harm to pregnant women but they also make addicts of the unborn human life in their wombs. Even before a new life enters the world, it is already suffering from the world it is yet to enter. New England Journal of Medicine, U.S., shows that one baby is born every half an hour addicted to some form of painkiller or opiate in the U.S., new figures have revealed. Whereas in 2004, seven babies in 1,000 were born dependent on narcotics, by 2013 the figure had leapt to 27 in every 1,000 by 2013. It also showed that the number of babies suffering from drug withdrawal at birth has quadrupled in the last decade. Dr. Paul Winchester, director of St. Francis Hospital in Indianapolis, said we had no idea that this was possible but now we do. A doctor at a hospital in Indiana told The Independent that the pharmaceutical companies, War on Pain, had targeted low-income mothers and made them dependent on morphine and mephedrone. 1040262.html the War on Drugs, 44 years after President Nixon declared War on Drugs. 
For U.S. states have now agreed to legalize the sale of marijuana and most Americans support legalization is a war that Western governments are desperately losing, the United Kingdom is currently fighting a war in which thousands of British people die needlessly each year. Deaths that the government, the media and the general population are guilty of turning a blind eye to. This isn't a small war either and it is one that takes place in the Northeast, in fact. It has been going on in the UK for over 40 years with the death toll climbing at an alarming rate. Last week, a report released by the Office of National Statistics on drug deaths in England and Wales made for depressing reading. Drug deaths last year totaled over 3,000 people, nearly 200 from the northeast, a 17% rise on the year before, with 67% of deaths attributed to illegal substances. Because liberal values do not value the sanctity of life enough to stop or even slow down this global drug epidemic. Sometimes, social vices are so pervasive and irrepressible that, amazingly, Regulating them becomes the lesser of the two evils as opposed to applying an outright ban. There is no greater social example of what happens when you place emphasis on the cure over prevention than the prohibition era in the early 20th century. How prohibition backfired and gave America an era of gangsters and speakeasies. Prohibition gangster speakeasies. Government policy, despite its zero-tolerance rhetoric, becomes so overrun by an avalanche of desires and lusts that welfare and healthcare are buried in the aftermath. If that is not indicative of the sorry state of a society and the impotence of a government and its policy then we are surely in a state of self-induced denial. In Paper 2, we will have a closer look at the legal punishments in Islam and their effectiveness in warding off all types of criminal activity. We will also take the time to debunk the growing smear campaign that comes in the form of spot the difference between Saudis legal punishments and ISIS illegal punishments.